Hello and welcome to another webinar from the Accountants Mastermind. My name is Mark and today I am joined by Mark Jenkins from The Gap. Say hello, Mark. John Scholl from Malik McLean Plus More and also a director, a director from The Gap and Simon Chaplin from the Accountants Mastermind. Hello. And today we are going to be talking to you about how to ignite your profits. So let's get started. Good morning. So um, welcome to our webinar uh, with uh, Mark Jenkins from The Gap, uh, John Scholl, who is from Malik McLean Plus More and also director of The Gap, and Simon Chaplin from The Accountants Mastermind. Um, this is going to be an um, excellent webinar today. Um, not only uh, do we have three great guests, but we also have two of them from the future. So they already know what's going to happen. So <laughs> Um, Mark is, I think, over in New Zealand and John is in Australia. So they've already seen how today has panned out. So they're going to be able to give you some great advice. Um, but as always, these webinars only work because of the questions that you ask. And we love stupid questions here. Uh, so if you can uh, think somebody else might not ask it, then please do ask it in the Q&A box. Um, and um, as I said, we love the questions and everybody loves the easy ones. It's the hard ones that uh, these guys will probably want to avoid. So um I think probably we should just get going on uh, today. Um, and I'll start with some uh, questions that we have been uh, sent in. So good morning, everybody. Or good evening, I believe, for two of you. Good morning for Simon. Who knows, good what, morning. Who knows what time zone Wizbeach is on? It's probably 1976, I think. But um, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll, we'll get started. So uh, the first question I have um, is... Um, Practical tips to price work in advance. So I don't know who wants to go first on that one, but um, yeah, that was a question from, give me a second, ah, I've lost the name. That's a question from Keith. So Keith asked, practical, practical tips to price work in advance. I'll go first if you like. So um, uh, be brave, I think is number one tip for me, be courageous. Um, there's a whole world of uh, pain in, for me, there's a whole world of pain for not telling people what you're going to charge them before you charge them. And um, uh, very often we undervalue the work that we do. And, and if we're brave around it, i.e. Um, uh, charging what we think we're worth, then uh, invariably we end up better off. Um, I am not one for timesheets. We'll get that out there in a minute. I know John is the other way around to me. So uh, for me, uh, monitoring or creating prices off the back of timesheets is an absolute no-no because you end up ambush billing, uh, i.e. you do the work and then you try and charge the client for it. And uh, very often they didn't know how much they was going to pay and all the rest of it. But anyway, yeah, so practical tip is set the price before you do any work whatsoever. Um, there's a theory uh, to do with the ladies of the night around desire and when it's best to uh, deliver that price. So you deliver the price, quote the price before you deliver the service, um, and then they have the opportunity to say yes or no. But uh, fundamentally, be brave around it. Yeah, look, I certainly agree that you've got to have some form of bravery when you're setting any price up front. You know, a couple of tips from me would be to scope the work, find out exactly what the client uh, wants as the result. Um, if you can, try and put in some check-in points. So don't price the whole job. Perhaps you can break it down into some milestones and therefore you can have a check-in at certain price points with the client. And I like to give a range. So I, if they were giving me a job and that was to do a piece of work, I might scope into three different areas and I would say, look, the first part might be between three and five thousand pounds or dollars or whatever currency you're dealing in. And that gives you a bit of a range. And then I normally say, look, I'll let you know if it's any more than that. Because while you don't want to ambush them, you sometimes don't want to overvalue or overprice the work either. So I think a, 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 for me, the fair way to do it is to try and put a bit of a range in um, and just keep communing communicating with the client and if you see the scope creeping um, just let them know that they, they they are starting to creep on the scope and that you'll have to perhaps reassess where the price is or that you've met the target of that first milestone so communicate 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 and break down as much as you can 
Yeah, and look, I, I've just got a little bit to add there, just a, a practical tip, price what you can control. Uh, and the things that are out of your control, uh, I, I, I do believe in the timesheet. I think there's a place for a timesheet if you go, if you say this chunk of work here, I know I can do the forecast for this. Uh, maybe you're looking at purchasing uh, a business. We can do the due diligence up to a point, but there's only this much. The negotiations, let's allow £5,000 for the negotiations. Um, if it's going to be more than that, I'll let you know. Um, if, if it's under that, I'll charge you less. Um, but that's my basis for, for working out the bit that I can't control. So otherwise, you know, if you get scope stretch, uh, it, it could be for legitimate reasons because the negotiations were harder than you thought. And you don't want to have to overprice that price, put a, put a full price on that to take into account a massive amount of negotiating you want to say well look you know for this for this section i used to say well i'm just going to charge you an hourly rate for that because the client is in control of how much the negotiate how much time is spent on the negotiating uh, so price what you can control what you can't control i think that it's a fair fair assumption to put a put you know a range on that or a you know a, an hourly rate on it Thank you. Just sorry. Did you want to add something else, Simon? Sorry. Well, yeah. There's a couple. There's a couple of things. So Mark, Mark's provoked me there. So I, I like the price. What you can control. Uh, my my sort of my challenge or the bit that's provoked me is that I believe that I can control most things. So within the accountancy environment, within my business, I can control. So the negotiation before we start a negotiation, we should have a set of boundaries where the client wants to work out what it is that they're going to pay or not. And through my experience and time, my knowledge, I should know that that's going to take me however long, three months, six months or whatever it is. And therefore I should be able to quote around that. And the second thing, when John was talking, John was talking about a range. Well, I, I am passionately against ranges. So if I ever share a range with somebody, their brain goes, if it's five grand to 10 grand, their brain goes, oh, it's going to be five grand or towards five grand. And then when I get to 10, 10 grand, I'm, I've knackered myself, excuse my French, but I've already out of anchored myself at the low figure. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, look, I've done that for many, many years, Simon. And actually, when you're coming under, people are surprised. So okay. I'd actually say it goes the other way. They, okay. If you said between three and five grand, um, they would think that you're going to charge 4995 and if you come in at three and a half or four or, or four grand, um, then they are quite often pleasantly surprised and, and delighted by that. I think the other thing that we didn't really discuss was value. So if I can save someone five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars in tax, for example, I might pick a number because it's my experience, it's my acumen, it's the systems and processes that we have. So I don't think we should get stuck on time either. Time is a good um, measure and back costing for that, but I think we can also go with value. But if you're starting out and you're not sure and you want to give it a go, uh, milestones with some ranges will help you from um, having a bad experience with pricing something up front and then never doing it again. Yeah, I love the milestones. The the and the, so from a, a if we're negotiating for the sale of a business or for the purchase of a business, that can be broken down to price agreement, heads of terms. SPAs, etc., etc. So I'll, I'll, I'll love that definitely. Sorry, I'll shut up, Mike. No, it's fine. No, I, I so for, obviously for me, um, as a lot of people know, my history is not being an accountant. So I find the the timesheet conversations really fascinating. And um, one of the questions that I, I I hear a lot, and probably more for uh, John and Mark, is how do you deal with the um, the kickback against? Well, if you're slower, I get charged more, or if your person isn't as good as what. If you were to do it, how, how how do you deal with those sort of um, arguments against what you, your your pricing way? I'm happy to oh, answer God. that to start with. I think the, the most important thing is that uh, I don't price uh, on an hourly rate for my team. I, I know what my team need to spend on on a job, so I wouldn't do an hourly rate for that. I was talking at a high level. If we're in a, into a negotiation and we've got a pedantic uh, solicitor on one side and an and a equally more pedantic solicitor on 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 our side and we're toing and froing, um, then then I would I would shift to an hourly rate because I I just think otherwise you're constantly having to get a recommitment with the client. Um, but certainly work that the team are doing, um, absolutely the 
the slow ones do that you know what 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 inevitably happens is they end up getting the slow ones that they the the client ends up paying more so um you have to standardize your pricing across the team um fixed price you know have, have an internal price list for all of the jobs that the team are doing if there's extra work you identify clearly what that additional work is you have a set price for that i'm thinking about dividends or extra tax returns or You know, maybe there's a, these national insurance changes that you've got coming up and won't get into the budget conversation. It's probably too early for that. But um, they'll really set Simon off. If I set them off with timesheets, I'm certainly going to set them off with the budget announcements. But um, I think that, that that having that internal price list and having it and sticking to that for your team is really essential. Excellent. Thank you. And, and I, I, I thank you for the sort of explanation between the two, because it, it also helps me. But I'm sure that other people, especially if they're starting out, would want to know the, the, the disparity. So I think we have the conversation a lot about the timesheets. And, and whilst I know Simon is against it, there is some very, really valuable using, uh, usage for uh, the timesheets uh, in the practice to, to learn stuff. Um, I just want to move on to another question that um, is around uh, this subject, and it was, how to feel confident about giving a fee quote. And that was from Mahendra. Who wants to go first? Oh, I went first last time, John. So yeah. go on. You can't, John. Oh, look, I, I don't think the, the discussion is that much different from what, what, what we've just had. I mean, you know, you get confidence by doing. And if you think you're going to get it right the first time, um, then after my 20 years of experience, I can say that, you know, you're going to get a mixed bag sometimes. But look, I think it's it's just being able to scope the work properly is the most important thing. Understand what you're agreeing to and the work that you're going to undertake and what the, the output is. And that's really, really important. Uh, you know, I work with over 40 accounting firms in Australasia and the biggest... issue I see is scope creep and people over delivering um, to their clients and therefore their average hourly rate um, diminishes because of that. Um, so if you're going to give upfront pricing, I think you've got to be, as Mark said, um, having a look at your price list, understanding what the average job might take in terms of time, what the value is to the client. Uh, the, the the most value is at that point of time when they're phoning you up. So if they're phoning you up for a cash flow because they need it for the bank to pay wages on Friday, um, then, you know, that's a pretty good time to state your price and shut up. And I'm not talking about price gouging, but I'm talking about a fair exchange of value um, from, from from what you're giving the, the client. And I'd probably just add to that on the confidence thing. The more you do it, the more confident you get. And we what we see a lot at the gap Uh, with firms who we, we do uh, pricing surveys um, and um, we we like have a, a, perfor a, a performance gap that we do as well. And we see a massive disparity in pricing between what people will charge, say, for a four-hour online uh, business planning session. Um, and I think the average price ended up in the UK a couple of years ago, sitting at £1,250 for that. But some people were charging £500 and some were charging £4,000. It's exactly the same service delivered in the same way through the gap using the content that was in there. And the difference was that the more people had delivered it, the more value they saw in it because they were getting feedback from the clients who were receiving the service and they felt more confident in, in pricing it themselves. So probably, probably really upset Simon now when I say probably start off with a price that you feel comfortable with and give yourself room to move up as your confidence builds. Because the first sale is to yourself, and if you don't see enough value in the service that you're offering yourself, when you try to pitch it to your client, they will tell that you feel nervous about this. Now, that's quite different to discounting. I'd never discount. You know, if you say, oh, look, this is the first time I've done one of these, I'm going I'm to discount it to you. You don't say that. You say, our price for this is, and say it with confidence, and zip your mouth. My price for the business plan is £1,000. And if they don't respond, you say plus VAT, and then you zip your mouth again, and then you just wait, wait for the response. That's the hardest thing to do. Then what will happen is people will give you the response, and the response is either going to be an acceptance or an objection. And if it's an objection, then you go back to your value proposition. So what is the value of this business plan to you, or what's the value of this forecast that John's talking about? 
you know, what's it going to be like for you if you can't pay wages this week? Uh, what will it be like the week after next? What's it going to be like if the bank says no um, in the future? That's starting to build up the value in the mind of the client. And in that situation, you might say, well, yeah, we're not going to ask you to pay for this up front. Maybe you pay 50% up front and 50% when the, um, the bank finance is achieved, something like that, so that you're showing some empathy for your clients as well. But I, I do think you get confidence from practice and from trying and the first sales to yourself. I couldn't agree more, Mark. So from my perspective, I know when I talk to clients, accountants as as clients within the mastermind, um, the it's it's a self-worth issue. The the price that you set, the price that you set is what you believe that you are worth to the client that you're talking to. And therefore, the more you believe in yourself and the more you believe in your own worth, then the more money you are uh, likely uh, to to charge and i remember when i first started uh, coaching and consulting with accountants it was it was like 500 quid a day it's like 500 quid a day because i'd never worked with accountants before i was charging more to greenstone's customers because i'd worked with greenstone's customers than i had with accountants well that's over the years that's gone up and i, re I remember when i increased it from 500 quid to 750 pound a day i was on the, i was walking along a canal and i quoted the client and the client said how much and it's like or the potential client how much it's like oh my god I'm I've gone completely over the top with that. And then three days later, they came back and agreed to work with me at 750 quid. And it, it is, it, it, it's in your head. And the other thing, as, as John said, the you've got to get it wrong. I get it wrong all the time. So it's like, I have this phrase, suck it up, buttercup. It's like, okay, I've got it wrong. Uh, what can I learn from it? What will I price it next time? So that, that's the experience. And every now and again, one will come along and I think, oh, I got away with one there or that one worked well or that was a bit over and I win some and I lose some. And over the course of whatever I've been doing it for there, 20 years, I think it averages out and it, and it works its way out. But unless you start doing it and get on with it, then you're never going to you're never going to learn and, and, and develop. And just coming back to the budget, Mark, because there's a, a big thing here. Uh, obviously, the employers' national insurance increases, and there's been some conversations within the community, within our community, about not being able to charge to work out now whether they should be having small salary, high dividends, and, and all that sort of stuff. And people are talking about giving that away because we've always given that away. And it's like, now, hang on a minute. There's all sorts of dynamics for individual people. You've got the pension contributions. You've got whether they get state pension, the employment allowance, whether they've got rent. There's a whole concoction. So unless the individual client for us is a basic PAYE and dividend client, there's a standard charge for that. But all the rest they need looking at and the work needs doing properly. But it's very easy for us to think, oh, it's, we just stick it in an Excel spreadsheet. We know how it works. We chuck a number out. We tell them what to do. And that's that's that is it's easy. But we, we undersell ourselves. And again, that goes back to the self-worth conversation. So, yeah, suck it up, book it up uh, and have a guess is the long and the short of it. And don't overanalyze just... it. That's the other thing. Sorry, it's like people sit there for days thinking about a price. It's like, no, you've, how much of your life have you wasted trying to work out whether you're going to charge 150 quid or 175 quid? Just say 175 quid and get on with it. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, just on that national insurance thing, uh, uh, another uh, value point that might be helpful is to say, okay, well, we do this calculation, the the tax savings or the cash flow savings to you are going to be, we're, we're going to ma maximize those for you. When you actually go to work out what those are, use five years. Say, well, if over five years, this will be worth X amount to you because that that concept then, it's not something you're going to have to do every year. Once you presumably, once you've worked it out, on average, this is going to save you this amount for the next five years. So we better get it right. You wouldn't want to pay this. So just otherwise you might find the value pieces lower than what your charge is going to be. Um, and so that just helps you get over that threshold. And I think the other important thing there, Mark, is that just because it's simple for you doesn't mean it's simple for the client. And it doesn't mean there's uh, of value to the client as well. And as accountants, we give uh, efficiency away. And a good example of that is we might buy a piece of tech software. It might cost us X number of pounds a year to subscribe to. Uh, that means that we're spending less time um, on the jobs and therefore our time and cost comes in at less and then we charge less. And so, but we've still incurred another cost. So we actually go backwards sometimes 
with efficiency. So if you're building a spreadsheet or you're doing anything like that, look to the value. As Mark said, if it's got an enduring value, put three to five years on it and say, this is the value to you of me doing that. And then your your fee will pale in comparison to probably what you've um, saved for that client. And not only what you've saved, but you've done it properly. They've got the right answer. They're coming to professionals for a reason. They're coming to you for a reason. They're coming to your brand for a reason. And you've just got to take all those things into consideration when you are thinking about what your value is to your clients because your clients rely on you, they trust you, they like you, and they want the right answer. You have mute, Mark. Oh yes, that's right. There you go. From my from my perspective, the value thing is it's got to be it's got to be right from the start. And I think there's some really useful tips there for everybody on how to uh, show value. So thank you very much. Um, moving slightly away from that is Susan has said we need to review all pricing. Uh, they're using uh, I'm presuming client engager or go proposal, and and she's saying that it's time consuming. Uh, so I'm thinking creating my own bot to help with this. Um, not massively a question, but I think what probably is being asked is what's the what's the quickest way of reviewing pricing? Mark, you can start this time because I think everybody else had to go first. Yeah, look, I think um, reviewing the pricing is it's something you need to do every year. Um, there was a, a UK um, firm that I was speaking to that was using um I think they were using Go proposal, and they hadn't put, they hadn't looked at their pricing in nine years, um, and I was just horrified. So, if you're using some uh, software for that, please make sure, as a minimum, you're looking at your um, at your pricing once a year. Um, I think that the important thing to do there as well is to, and, and this is where the timesheet comes in helpful, is to back cost how you're going, um, whether or not you're doing well or not. Or if you don't have that, you should be looking at making sure you're getting a 50% margin um, in, your, in your your trading area. So if you've got your, 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 your direct income coming in, take your direct costs out of there, including a, a market salary. Forget about how, what you're doing with your national insurance and dividends. Put in a, a salary figure in there for you. Um, in New Zealand, we work, work on around about $175,000, which... Um, is probably around uh, ninety thousand um, pounds as a fair market salary. So whatever whatever you think the fair market salary is, put that in. If you're not making more than fifty percent GP um, out out of your business, then you're either pricing incorrectly um, or you're working inefficiently. So that's your yardstick to check how you're going uh, to make sure that you're getting that right sort of multiplier as well. So um, yeah, hopefully that's answered the question. I'm sure the others have got more to add there. Yeah, I think it's important to review your prices annually. We certainly do here in our business, and we take quite a bit of time to do that to get that right. Uh, a lot of our business is recurring, um, so therefore we need to make sure that what we've done last year for our clients um, compared to this year, how does that fit in with our known budget around our, our team and what our margin looks like. So, you know, when I'm working with a lot of accounting firms, um, I try, try and separate the cost from the revenue. So most of our costs inside an accounting firm are fixed, whether it's our, our staff costs, whether it's our overhead costs, whether it's our software provider costs, we can... We know within a very small percentage uh, what our costs are going to be for the for, for a year. Um, it's really our revenue that tends to go up and down. So investing time and knowing what your revenue is from your annual recurring is really, really important. And if you're not getting your margin of 50%, then pop your prices up to try and meet um, that gauge of what I think is not best practice, but what is the average you, you should be getting for that. And so I would encourage you to invest time. If you want to use a bot, use a bot. But for me, um, nothing better than eyeballing and investing a little bit of time to get those recurring fees right. And I'll, I'll just – so I know you've got a pricing model within your software, Mark, haven't you, within, within the Gap, within the gap yeah. software. So I, I would use software that's already – built uh susan I, I wouldn't be creating my own bot as an accountant i'm not a software engineer or whatever um, i would 
my value is delivering service to the client. So I would use a program of whatever it is, whether it be the Gap One or any of the others um, uh, that are out there for a couple of reasons. One, um, it gives me a discipline. So when I am talking to a client and the price comes up, that challenges me. If I think that price is too high, it challenges me to think about whether it's right or not and whether I was right or not, rather than just sticking my finger in the air and picking a price out. And then secondly, it enables me to leverage the team and my time. So the pricing can go within the software and then the team can start doing the pricing and delivering the pricing. And as Mark said, uh, increase the pricing and review the prices every uh, year. So my current record, Mark, is 16 years uh, for an accountant that was charging one of their first clients the, exactly the same amount of money for doing their annual accounts 16 years later than what they got. It's like, how on earth have they managed to uh, manage to do that? So uh, don't write your own bot, Susan. Pick one of the others. Get on with it. One that works uh, the best for you. Um, and then the margin, the gross margin, the 50%, I again, this is messing with my head at the moment. So over here, we used to have this third, third, third thing. So third overheads, third wages, third net profit, which feels archaic now uh, uh, from, from when it used, we used to talk about it. And the bit that's challenged me around it is it depends on what your service model is, what your strategy is. So in, if I'm in my world, if I'm delivering lots of meetings, high value work, et cetera, et cetera, there will be a higher labor cost of that than what there will be if I'm in a sausage factory. So if I'm producing lots of work and the, the way it was challenged with me is that somebody said to me, do you think Ryan Ayer's staff costs are the same as the Emirates staff costs? And it's like, do you want to be the Emirates? They will have a higher staff cost because they'll have more people, they'll have call centers and all the rest of it. Or do you want to be a Ryanair, which is all le less friction, all on the mobile phone, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, and it, I, I haven't got an answer to this, Mark, and it's something that I've been playing with now for, for 18 months, nearly two years, as to how... Uh, that margin should be depending on the service level or the service system that you're providing. And there's got to be a better measure out there for us to measure productivity than team cost divided by uh, fees. But that's another... Well, hang on, Simon. I mean, that's, that, that's ultimately your result at the end of the month, quarter, year, for you to go back and say, am I in, am I in the money or out of the money there? And using a metric... That is really easy to calculate. Like would be average hourly rate. What's my what's my average hourly rate divided by my total revenue divided by everyone's working hours? And then, as your trend, your friend, is your trend going up or down? Will tell you whether you uh, your pricing is either going in the right direction or you're falling behind. Whether you're not putting your prices up at all or not meeting inflation or the other costs that uh, simply creep up on you over time. So. In, in my part of the world, wage costs have increased quite a bit um, in the last four to five years. And so that's made us rethink our pricing models and how we value what we do. But having a central metric that you can measure year on year to see how you're doing as a business owner is something that we would tell our clients to do. And whether you think it should be 50, 30, 40, everyone's playing their own game. But what I would say to um, those out there on this webinar is – Ask yourself, where is my trend going? Am I going up in terms of profitability and margin or am I going down? And we can argue all day whether it's 40, 50, 60. I've got, I've got clients that are close to 70, but yeah. they are doing a lot of hours um, themselves doing high work and they're not leveraged. Whereas, you know, for someone like our business, we get quite a lot of holidays. Um, and so our GP margin might be quite a bit different as well. So everyone's running their own race. But what oh, I would say is pick, pick, pick some metrics and, and go with it. And is the trend your friend? Yeah, yeah. so compare, compare yourself. So I can't remember what the phrase is now, but you compare yourself against yourself. Uh, yeah. It helps you get better rather should... than comparing yourself to what this third, third, third over here is. Uh, it just it, it just winds it winds me up. And the manipulation yeah. of that metric pricing is obviously one of the one of the ways of manipulating that metric. But also doing a shit job or sorry a rubbish job is another. So it's like let's just cut loads of corners. Let's not do a job at all, and then the wage cost will go down. The price will stay the same, and therefore my metrics my metrics gone up. So. Yeah, but that's not a long-term strategy, though. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm hamming it up for effect. But, uh, yeah, so uh, as long as you're comparing yourself against yourself, 
and where you want to go for the service that you want to deliver, then um, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Mark, if I could just uh, circle back on something that you said about um, the increases per year. And again, uh, fear for people putting their prices up and stuff like that. Do you have, would you suggest in any case to have a minimum of a certain percentage? How, how would you, if people were fearful of doing a full review of their pricing and putting them up as a, as a worked out price, which I think is what John was talking about earlier on, you know, investing the time. Um, would you have, a, 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 would you suggest that doing a minimum percentage or what, how would you work that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and conscious that you know, there's lots of different answers to this for different circumstances. We don't have all of the context here, but I think one, one thing that's really important to do is to look at your trend. You know, how, how are you, how are you tracking? Do you need to catch up or, or not? I would also then look at the some some of your clients as well. So some of your clients you'll be you you're unlikely to be losing money, but your average hourly rate on some jobs will be lower than it is on others. So if we say what did we charge? What was the fee for this job? And how many how many hours of team time did we put in? We can work out the average hourly rate. Uh, then we can say okay, we need to reprice that one. So taking those exceptions out, I would say then you've got to have a global look and say, right, what's happened with the economy? Obviously, the last few years has been you know, high inflation. So the minimum you should be looking at is to maintain the margin above whatever the wage price index has been, whatever the, you know, whatever they call it in, in the UK, where, where if wages have gone up by 5%, then your pricing probably needs to go up by 7% to, to make sure you're covering that, that additional cost that you've got there. So I, and I think there was a question too about whether whether you communicate that to the clients. Absolutely, you must. In my view, we, we, we've got to be we've got to give our clients certainty. We're not going to just try and slip in a five percent increase every year and not say something. I, with all of my clients, I say this is the fee. This is what it's going to be, um, and 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 we 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 set our fee at the beginning. So so it's a mixture. I'd say there will there will be some clients that might not even need a price increase, um, so they might just get an inflation increase. But there's probably going to be a whole bunch that are wasting your time. They're not fun to deal with. The team are not enjoying working with them. They're not living into your core values. They're not paying you on time. They might need a twenty percent price increase or a twenty five percent increase. They might need a um, they might be need to be shown the door of opportunities, the exit door of opportunities, but but there, there could be an opportunity to give them, you know, that 20, 25% price increase. Yeah, I'd certainly agree, Mark, with that. Yeah, there's, there's, there's four things that we really look for. The first one is work your tail. So the bottom 20% of your clients, um, what are they actually doing for your business? They're probably dragging it down. They probably need a large increase. And so I haven't met too many accountants that don't have a lot of work on. Um, and generally speaking, you need to be um, you know, applying the law of supply and demand. So when new clients come on, they should be at the top end of your pricing. Um, your tail should be at the bottom. And what the other thing that I would suggest you do is that when you do your budget for the year, if you've worked out what your pricing is roughly going to be, have a look at what your profit is and then compare it to last year's and see what your inflation, inflation adjustment is. Um, and that gives you a bit of an idea of whether your pricing is enough because, as Mark suggested, your uh, salary increases, your supplier increases are all guaranteed. So if they go up 5%, um, you're not guaranteed to put up every price from a client by 5%. So I think you just need a little bit more. So, you know, I sort of apply the 50% um, more again. So if inflation was at 5%, my starter would be seven, seven and a half um, across the across the board because I know fundamentally that will be close to five by the time I've finished. And I'm I'm not going to disagree with any. I love the opportunity, the door of opportunity, Mark. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to use that one. I don't know where that came from, but I will credit you for sharing it with me. But I love that one. We have a, a thing at Greenstones, uh, we, less so over recent years, but once upon a time, we used to pick 12 clients a year. So the team is like, who do we want to stop working with and why? Uh, and the team would pick 12 clients. And then over the course of the next 12 months, we'd pick one client a month and we'd have a conversation with them and show them the door of opportunity. 
Um, and that door, in fact, there was two doors of opportunities. One was to go and go somewhere else. Uh, and the second one, generally speaking, was to respond more quickly uh, and deliver information to us or uh, increase uh, the price. Uh, so what we're doing for you isn't worth us doing it. And nearly always, I'll guess at 11 out of 12, I did have the stats once upon a time, but I'll guess at 11 out of 12, they'd be shocked uh, that the, they weren't paying enough or more often than not, that the fact that they weren't responding to the seventh email asking for whatever bank statement it was, was causing us a problem. And as soon as we said, we can't work for you unless you start responding, all of a sudden they got the, they got the asses in gear and started delivering. So uh, thanks for that, Mark. <laughs> Uh, for us at Greenstones, just to finish off and go back to the question, we increase our prices every year on the 1st of August. We pick a figure, calculated figure, generally speaking, an inflationary figure. And that price goes out to everybody, to every client. Um, and then what should happen, and I can't stand here hand on heart or sit here hand on heart and promise that it does. But before the year end, every year, the client gets a quote, a conversational quote about what it is that we're going to do for them the following year. So if we're doing accounts, we'll have a conversation about payroll, bookkeeping, cash flow forecasts, anything else that we could be doing for them, re-quote the whole service, and then they sign the, uh, sign the proposal. That tends to happen with the bigger ones only. What really happens with the, the smaller ones is the proposal goes out, it's 5% or whatever it is, higher. Most of them sign it and send it back. Some of them don't. Nobody really moans about it. Occasionally, you'll get somebody moan about it. But yeah, there, it's got to happen. There's got to systematically happen. Air, air trigger is the year end, so it's got to systematically happen. Otherwise, before you know where you are, you're 16 years down the line and you've not increased the prices at all. Can I just add one last little piece in here? Sure. We're, we're probably assuming some things here, um, which I just want to be clear on. If you don't meet with your clients at least once a year, you don't get the opportunity to talk about, you know, the value you've already provided, the, you know, the tax savings you've given them or the benefits that they're getting to be uh, with you. And if all you're doing is sending out e-signing sets of financial statements, then you're on a race to the bottom. So please, with all the technology that's there, please make a commitment with your business clients to meet with them at least once a year talk about the value you've provided, talk to them about how they could work with you better, talk, ask them how you could serve them better, ask them what their goals and their problems and challenges are and work out what, how you should serve them for the next year. What you'll probably find is that that will open up higher value work for you with those clients that isn't a commodity that isn't a, a price that they can shop around for. And all of a sudden, your average hourly rate will increase. So I'm just seeing far too many examples of accountants using technology as the reason to not meet with their clients. So is that before they show you the door of opportunity, Mark? Is that what you're saying? That's right. <laughs> you're just on a race to the bottom otherwise. Um, Simon, so just a very quick question on the back of what you've just said. Um, if they didn't sign... What do you do about the price increase? I just, just it's the proposal goes out and it says if we've not heard from you within twenty eight days, I think yeah, it is twenty eight days. Um, the price we just increase the invoice. So, so I'm, I'm going to say all of our clients. There are exceptions to this rule, but all of our clients are billed, invoiced in year. So by the time we get to the thirty first of December twenty four, are we in there? Yeah, thirty first. Any December twenty four year ends have already been invoiced and paid for their December 24 accounts and their 24, 25 tax returns. Um, so we just, we just increase, you just increase the invoice. Excellent. And um, so potentially people could get two price increases over the base of 12 months. Is that right? I'm, I'm going to say potentially yes, because um, not all of them are done how they should be done. <laughs> they should be done. So uh, there's a there's a whole world of pain. I was going to share. There's, I've got a bookkeeping job. We've got a bookkeeping job, and I know we make a gross loss on that bookkeeping job. So, uh, I pay the wages that I pay are less than what we charge the client. Yeah. Now we look at it, and we are as efficient as possible, and all the rest of it. Do I have commercial reasons for accepting a gross loss on that job? I'm going to say yes. Uh, I will argue about it. We argue about it. The client is a specific individual that provides us with lots of referrals and blah, 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 blah. Is it potentially because we haven't got the <laughs> courage to approach that client? Yes, there's that. There's that 
there's that debate there. It's an, it's an emotional uh, decision. But the simple answer to it is, is everybody gets a price increase every year. Uh, could they get a price increase more than once in a year? Then the answer to that is uh, yes. They shouldn't do really, but they could do. I mean, if they extend the scope and they have payroll, bookkeeping or whatever, then yes, they get a price increase. But they, sh they shouldn't do it if they've got the same, same level of service. So just to convert some of my language, the price increase and then the price, potentially price review. Yeah, on, on yeah, what services yeah that's a good, a good way yeah. of saying it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Polly, your question about would you separate uh, communication to all your clients, I think Mark's answered that in uh, uh, previously. So um, if, if not, then just let us know if there's anything missing from that. Um, so uh, Polly's also asked but previously on, on joining into the webinar is what options are there to make paying easier for clients? We'll go with John first, shall we? Uh, so we just, uh, well, look, we just offer um, direct debit. Uh, they can pay us directly if it's a one-off piece of work. Um, we've got Visa, go cardless. Um, we've got any number of different ways. We offer fee financing here as well. So the, they've got the opportunity to pay it off over six months if they need to through a fee financing facility. So we just try and make it um, as easy as possible for clients to make the choice that they want to make. Uh, we do service plans for some of our clients um, through the gap. They have a, an opportunity there for us to do that. So some clients we put through that, especially if they are starting out in business, just makes makes life easier for everyone. Um, and we do charge upfront for a lot of the work that we do do as well. So we've got short, really short payment terms, um, which our clients are used to, and normally the bill would be paid before they come to see us to do uh, to undertake any work. So, give them as many ways as possible, uh, make it easy for them. And I think I just add a distinction there. Not, nothing more to add um, on the pricing options, but one thing that just picking up on what Simon was saying, I, I do see people who they do the work for the client, they. The client says, I can't afford to pay that, and they spread the payment over the next 12 months, and they don't charge interest on it. To me, that's that's crazy. I like Simon's method. As soon as a client comes in, you're talking about your payment plan. They start paying straight away. If they've come in midway through the, the cycle, if you like, um, and you've only got six months worth of payments for that, that year's set of financial statements, then work it out, put a balloon payment in at the beginning or come to some arrangement so you're being really clear that what you're paying for in this year gets you this the previous year's set of financial statements or the following years. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly different to what Simon was doing, but we're really clear. It's the VAT returns and PAYE returns or whatever for that year plus the annual accounts for the prior year. That's how I, I did it. But Simon sounds like he's doing the VAT and um, the PAYE uh, returns for the current year, and they're paying in advance for the next year's financials. That my challenge with that is, what happens if they leave? You're going to potentially have to give them a, a refund of some of that money, or do you keep the money? I'm not sure, but that, that's not really so important. It's just if you're going to spread the payment, have the proactive conversation about the spreading of that payment before the fact, not afterwards. Otherwise, you're out of pocket. Yeah, just to top that on, Mark. So, uh, sorry. So, one of the points we accrue for some of the income. So, if we're billing in year for the, which we are for the majority of them, then we keep some of that money back, and it goes as deferred income until we do the year end accounts and whatnot. And and if anybody leaves, we refund that money or a percentage of the money for the job that we've not done. I'm not. I don't agree with keeping it. If we've not done the yeah. work, then we do not keep. Uh, do not keep the money. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned on the way through, because this again, it really winds me up. It's like. How, how do you get to the point where a client says to you that you they can't afford to pay you? It's like, okay, I've done the work, and now you're telling me it's like hey, you're telling me that you can't afford to pay me. I want to know that on day. I want to know that on day one. And it's like people say, how do you get people to agree to direct debit, Simon? It's like, well, why would they not? Uh, they don't trust me. Okay, well, if you don't trust me, I don't want to work with you. Or you might make take the money and the money not not be in the bank account. So okay, well, I want to I want to know that now. I don't want to be collecting a direct debit in six months time or one month's time and there not be the money there. So is it you don't trust me or the, the, the money's not going to be in the bank? Both of those are fundamental for me. Uh, fundamental for me. So I just I kind of logically, if I'm not going to get paid for something, I want to know I'm not going to get paid for it now rather than whenever. But anyway, I don't start me on that. So the majority of ours are on direct debit. We also offer 
uh, they can pay up they can pay up front we do the credit card thing same as john and we've got a little funding thing prepaid thing that they can do through uh cresco we have a lady little old lady that's been a client for donkey's year since 1982 we send her an invoice she sends a check uh the next day they run off to the bank there's a novelty for the team it's like what's this um and away they go so we still have the odd one um uh, like that but the majority of the vast majority um, are direct debit can I just add to that, Simon, uh, it's your business, you set the rules, especially with new clients coming on board. Uh, so when new clients are coming on board, especially from another accountant, they've probably had a negative experience. Yep. So that does not mean you have to have the same terms as that accountant. It doesn't mean you have to price match. In fact, you know, one of the um, things that I try and encourage with the accountants that I work with is that if you're not 20% more than the other accountant, um, then you're probably likely to do a similar job as the last accountant as well. And so I think part of the value of what we do and how we price is the fact that we price to do the job properly. And I think that's very important for us to realise as well. We don't have to price match with the lowest. We have to price match with the quality of others that are in a similar position to us in market. you will mute again. Just on mute, Mark. Sorry, that's my mic. Um, sorry, one quick question for you, John. Um, you said short terms, um, which I, fi I find quite interesting. So what would you define as short terms for what you're involved? Uh, so our invoicing is 14 days, um, which is uh, something that is probably more usual now. But, um, you know, at the time when we did it, everyone was still 20th of the month following. And, and we did it. And look, we had very little pushback. It's like most things. You worry about it and then it happens and you go, oh, well, that was easy. No one really noticed. And, you know, people generally get led by whatever's written on the piece of paper or whatever people say. So um, that's something that I've learned over my time as well, that um, some of these things feel really big. And then when you do them, it just suddenly just seems to happen. When new clients come in, you say you're going on direct debit and they go, cool, that's obviously the rules here and that's what we'll do. Um, and don't forget that, the compound over time is really, really uh, important. So you don't have to do everything all in one one week, one month, one year even. It's if you can collectively get clients on DD over time, every opportunity you get, you'll look back in two or three years and go, wow, we've got 30 40 50% of our clients on, on DD. So don't feel like you have to do everything at once either. Thanks, Simon. This might one might be more for you, but based on the UK offering. Uh, but part of that question is uh, Doug has asked us is what software other than go go sorry, other than go cardless. Um, what direct debit software is there? So we we are using Easy Pay. I'm I'm sure we're using Easy Pay on Greenstones at the moment, but I didn't have anything to do with that decision. That was a t a team decision. Uh, uh, to move from go cardless because of the cost that we uh, the cost were involved but if Doug wants to know I can find I can find out <laughs> categorically find out but I'm 99 percent sure it's easy pay brilliant thank you so I'm conscious that we've got uh rattled through 13 minutes left I think if I'm, my uh, mass is right um so we'll go to uh, John's questions of uh, do you benchmark your pricing I think Mark you talked about a little bit on this before but is there anything else to add on benchmarking pricing? Yeah, look, I think it's really important to to benchmark your pricing. Uh, that's one of the the beauties of the the mastermind group. I'm I'm sure Simon can add into this as well. But um, we have a lot of groups, and uh, you know, John looks after groups of accountants, and so do I. And um, so we'll often have conversations around pricing, and not not that the Commerce Commission wants to know about this or whatever your authority is in in the UK, but. Um, we we have been asked many times by our members, you know, for guidance on on pricing. Uh, so we we do pricing surveys, but uh, there's a we can't give guidance on pricing because that that would be deemed to be you know some sort of um, collusion or um, anti competition behaviour that sort of thing. So um, I think the benchmarking the best way to do that is to join a group of like minded people. Um, who are similar to you in terms of the quality of the work that they do. So, you know, joining the mastermind group would be ideal for that. Um, and then and ask others, find find networks of, of people that are like you and and just ask and, and benchmark that way. Um, I, I think that it's uh, it's harder to do this. We Our pricing survey, we do that every couple of years um, and, and we'll share that. That's not for all services uh, and 
Um, you know, we also do a performance gap um, survey, which gives an indication of, you know, some of that GP percentage that firms are making or whether whether the firms that use timesheets make more money or not, Simon, um, or the you know, firms that do advisory more, whether they make more money or not, those sorts of things. So, of course, you want to surround yourself with with experts and, and ask the questions and technology makes that super easy right now. <laughs> Um, I'd also add to that, Mark, there's a couple of other ways that you could do it. One is to ask your peers and colleagues. So if you all have a look at a piece of, a, uh, piece of work, uh, write it down on a piece of paper and then put it all on the put them all on the table in the middle, uh, in the middle and um, take the highest uh, because it's amazing what price ranges we just have within our own offices as well. So if you're, if you're not in a group or, or you're not sure what's happening in market, then I would encourage you just to have a blind um, um, sort of challenge between two or three people just to see what they think the price of something should be um, without looking even at a timesheet just, just to try and gauge that value. I think the other thing that I would say is that quite often, and of course there's boundaries with this, but no one really knows the price of anything. Um, you know, we can pay for a bottle of water, can cost, um, you know, uh, can be very cheap in, in a warehouse uh, type shop, can be very expensive in an airport or on a plane or wherever you might buy it. So, you know, the value is in the eye of the beholder. And while the bottle might be the same, the situation might be quite different as well. So, um, you know, for me, it's about ranging your pricing and, and don't don't just because the person down the road is charging £500 to do something doesn't mean that you should be and doesn't mean that all your clients will go down the road just because that person's at £500 and you might value it at 700 as well. So um, there are massive price differentials uh, within accountants for for lots of reasons and clients need a bad experience uh, to leave or need to have a very good experience through a peer or a colleague to look at something else as well. So just, just remember that when you're going through looking at pricing. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely uh, second the the pricing survey benchmark in whatever language you want to uh, call it. We did one at the back end of last year as part of the Know Your Numbers uh, process. Uh, and the one that stuck out for me, the, the, there was a the, between the lowest and the highest on a three-way forecast. Uh, it was five times as much. So was, the, there was a firm charging five times, and it's like people look at it and go, "Wow, how are they doing that?" Well, they're just they're quoting it with 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 confidence. Um, and that survey, just <laughs> I'm bound to share this, but just because it's but um, that survey, the the firms that was keeping timesheets were generally speaking charging less than the firms that weren't keeping. Uh, work keeping timesheets but um, so i'll just i'll just um i'll just throw that in there but go, going back to the, the original question um char charge you know again we've this is where we started this morning you know what you should be charging you should be charging more than what you're currently charging i've got umpteen stories as i'm sure mark and john have as well where accountants have gone through they've repriced their clients and can't believe that they haven't done it a more and b uh sooner there's one that springs to mind she was charging £85 a month. She increased it to £95 a month, didn't lose a client at all and wish she'd gone to £115 a month. She did the second year and again, didn't lose any clients. And when you talk to her, it's like, Simon, I sat down and I added up all those £10 and then all the £25 and I multiplied it over the five years that I hadn't charged it. And that was a big number. I could have bought a house with it. And it's like, yes, yeah, so get on with it and um, put the prices up. Anyway, sorry. Uh, it's fine. It's because I think between those answers, there. Uh, so Bicola's asked a question about how do you price as a small startup practice when you're bidding for a job against a much more established uh, practice. Yeah, I'll go first. So, firstly, so sorry to be blunt. If I, I, can. I won't. I won't going to ask. I won't going to ask. I was just going to say I think he's covered it, but you carry on. Okay. Yeah. No. So. Um, yeah. No. So look, I come across this quite a bit. So. Uh, during COVID, when people let people left practices because they weren't allowed to work from home and all that sort of stuff, and they started practices, what they did and what they're doing now is that they undercut their previous employer by a bit because that's how they thought they was going to win the work, and they've now anchored their price. So the prices that they're now charging are anchored against the prices that they were charging four years ago, which was a bit less than the places which they uh, which they left. So be very careful about anchoring. And the second one, it really, again, it winds me up when people talk about being a small firm and not being able to compete against the bigger boys. And generally speaking, that comes out in pricing and recruitment. There's a thing called predatory marketing. 
And predatory marketing is where you exploit what you think are the strengths of the person that you're competing against. So let's call it a bigger firm. Why do you think they're charging more money than what you are charging? Let's say that you think they're more experienced than you. They've got a better technical knowledge than you. So how can you predicate against that or say, okay, well, we work more closely with our client and therefore we have a better understanding of that. And therefore we can provide better specific technical advice to you than this big firm that just sends out a budget report every year. So being small, in my mind, being small is an advantage and is therefore worth more to a customer than a big firm you're more available hopefully you're around more you've got less clients etc cetera, etc cetera. so um get the small firm mentality out of your head and uh, quote again quote what you're worth and sorry i'm i just can't help but ju jump in here too the the num the ability to be agile and nimble when you're smaller please offer more than just the compliance services offer something more that isn't they can't get a comparison offer something like a cash flow and profit improvement meeting or a business health check or a risk review or a or a, an annual tax review or something put something in there that makes you different makes you stand out from your competition and that's that that way we're not in this commoditized race to the bottom on pricing yeah look i think i um, well, look, I don't disagree with either of you at all. I just think it comes down to confidence, and I would work backwards. If you're going out on your own, um, you probably want to be working less hours than when you were working before. Therefore, your prices probably need to be a bit higher, and you just have to find what that point of leverage is. And it's about getting a higher average hourly rate. So how do you do that? You do that through advisory. And so when I'm working with accounting accountants just starting out, as Mark said, I'm encouraging them to do business plans. I'm encouraging them to do regular advisory meetings because they are valued by the client because they are getting to their goals faster. You're able to articulate their successes um, more regularly and they will attribute more to you. And if you check me out on LinkedIn, I just had a client post the other day who said, um, who said, great working with John. He's been working with me for a year and his business has really grown. He was a rental. He was uh, he uh, looks after rental properties. He had less than 100. Within um, 18 months, he's now got 400. And we increased his pricing by about 3% on the rental. And we added an administration charge of uh, $25 for every, uh, every month for each of the houses and that and he attributes a lot of his success to me but only because I work with him and because I work with him I get to know his business I understand what his personal goals are I know what his business goals are I know what his family commitments are and how to spend more time with his family and uh you know they credit that and they value that with you but it's 95 percent of them doing the work it's you just meeting with them, understanding, listening, working the numbers, and that's what we're really good at, the empathy part and the numbers bit. So, you know, get amongst it, be a bit different, but work more closely with your clients. Excellent. Thank you. So we've got time for everyone to have one minute on this next question. So the next question or the last question um, I'm going to ask, but Simon, you're not allowed to put put your prices up as being the answer to this question. In fact, nobody is. However, what was the number one marketing tool to help you win business? Uh, John, we'll start with you. A number one tool. Uh, so we do regular boardroom briefings and um, zero, um, zero training sessions. And I don't, I'm not lying, we get other accountants turning up to our zero training sessions. So it is just a wonderful melting pot of new clients coming along and we get a lot of referrals and leads um, through those free educational 45-minute um, sessions with a free one hour afterwards. So uh, I'm, I'm going to ask oh, two things. If I, sorry, you finished, John. No, yep. Yeah, so John John went lead gen there. I'll go lead conversion just to mix it up uh, slightly. So the best thing that we ever did uh, from a conversion perspective is to talk 
to the client about the potential in their business. And within the gap software called Profit Gap Analysis, Mark, is it? Have I got that right? Profit Gas? That value Gap Analysis. Value yeah. Gap Analysis, which basically you sit down with a client, uh, you put their numbers into it, you mess about with some levers, so leads gen and all the rest of it. It comes out with the potential profit that it can make very small adjustments, 1%, 2%. It comes out with a number. Your fees are dwarfed in connection with that number that they come out. And then you work the line, how does this compare to what your current accountant's doing? They go, it doesn't. And they're, they're, you've won the work, basically. If you're in a beauty parade, you'll have done something that the other two, three accountants or whatever it is. You, so you'll just massively differentiate yourself by using the proper value gap analysis or whatever uh, you to, de to demonstrate how you can deliver that extra value. Um, and then the thing I'd just like to go back to, if I may, um, I can't remember if it was John or Mark talked about, you don't have to do it all at once. So the eight, it took us 18 months to go from billing. We was billing six months in advance and six months in arrears, not on direct debit, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it was a, a process where we went over. We dealt with the small ones first and the ones that we call less commercially sensitive, i.e. the ones where the profit in it is significant. And if we lost that client, then it would hurt. So deal with the ones that are less commercially sensitive first. And then over a period of 18 months, uh, you can move across. So don't think of it as a big job. Just think, about the elephant and taking the bite. Yeah, can I also and add, our, Simon? Our, our our free one hour is the value gap and uh, analysis. That's showing the that's money. Your lead, that's your uh, con yeah, yeah, free yeah. Consultation. converts yeah. 80, 90 percent of the time, yeah, at no least. Brainer. Yep. And if we were just just to add, and I know we're out of time here, just John went with lead gen. Simon, you went with convert um, conversion. I'm going to go with average transaction value. So average fee per client. So I'm talking internal marketing. The single best thing we ever did was we met with our clients, split the annual accounts review meeting in half, half looking in the rear view mirror. What's the value we've already provided? We shared a value register with our clients, showing them the value we'd provided. And we spent the next half of the meeting looking forward. What are the client's goals? What are their problems and challenges? Showing them that value gap calculator, showing them what's possible and then reviewing the services that we could provide that would help them get to those goals quicker. That lifted the average fee per client, was the best internal marketing we ever did, and um, yes, yeah, super successful. Excellent. Thank you very much. That just uh, leaves me to um, just, uh, Mark, um, how would uh, people get in touch with you and talk to you about the gap? What's the best way? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll probably just pop into the chat here, you know, some things that we've got coming up. We have a, an event um, on the annual accounts review uh, meeting. We've got um, we've got a UK person um, coming to help us share that. That's on the 26th of November. Uh, but this that link that I'm just sharing now takes you to our website as well, um, and all our details are on there. Um, we'd be really happy to hear from anyone. We've got a, a team in the UK uh, work very closely with Simon and and Accountants Mastermind Group. We we Simon's one of our gap approved coaches. Um, we we, we you know, think that Simon does a great job, and we're we're by accountants for accountants. The the content that we've that we have is written by accountants for accountants. Excellent, and uh, thank you for sharing, John. So, if anybody wants to get in touch with uh, John, uh, there's his uh, LinkedIn. Um, and I'd just surprise on Michelle. Hopefully, Michelle can put our website on. But obviously, you'll be getting an email from us anyway. So, if um, you need any more information um, on the Accountants Mastermind, then please uh, reach out to uh, one of us. Um, so that uh, again just leads me to say thank you very much. I think possibly uh, we could have done another hour and a half at least on uh, some of this stuff. Um, and, and next time we might even get Simon to get his soapbox out on a couple of those issues as well. So, <laughs> um, but yes, leads me to say thank you very much to everybody. John, uh, Mark, it was great to meet you and uh, we'll catch you all very soon. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, bye -bye. Bye -bye. thank you for watching our webinar with Mark and John from The Gap and also Simon from here at The Accountants Mastermind. If you liked it, please click on the like button now. If you have any further questions, please uh, put them in the comments uh, below. Uh, also, subscribe to our channel to ensure that you uh, keep up to date with all of our latest recordings and information to help inspire, challenge and support you to be the best you want to be within your accountancy or bookkeeping practice. On the screen somewhere below now, you should be seeing some videos that we suggest you watch next to have the best practice you can. Thanks very much for sticking by.